Welcome to the third part of the Ancient Roman Iceberg. If you haven't seen the first part or part two, I would definitely recommend you go check those out, as they cover some things that we are going to get deeper into in this episode. Anyway, let's get into the video. We start with the fourth layer of the iceberg, represented by Sola. This layer represents some very important people, events, and questions that I think are only really known about in name and don't tend to get focused on nearly as much as they should be. We start with a question that I think a lot of people ask, but quite simply there isn't a clear answer to, and that is who is the successor to Rome? This question has been asked thousands of times, and I know everyone has their own answer. Let me lay some groundwork before I list some of the most common answers and the reasoning behind them. First of all, we have to define what exactly Rome is. Roman history is typically split into four or so portions. We have the Roman Kingdom from around 753 to 509 BCE. Then we have the Roman Republic from 509 to 31 BCE. Then we have the United Roman Empire from 31 BCE to around 286 AD. And finally, we have the period of the split Roman Empire from 286 to the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476. Those years are all rough estimates. Some sources will put the beginning and the end of various periods at different points, but this is roughly the agreed upon start and end dates of the various periods of Roman history. It's at this point that we have to start asking who is the successor to Rome? Well, the obvious and probably objectively correct answer at this point in history is the Eastern Roman Empire. Today, we call it the Byzantine Empire, but during its history, the empire viewed itself as the Roman Empire. And really it was, just with the Greek spin. Remember, this empire was centered in Constantinople and Greece, and so Greek language, culture, and so on became much more influential as the Byzantine Empire aged. As the Byzantines controlled the east and prospered, the west became a bit of a mess. The Ostrogoths took over the city of Rome, along with Italy and portions of Illyricum following the downfall of Romulus Augustulus, the last western Roman emperor. But the main successor we need to look at in the west would be the HRE, or the Holy Roman Empire. The HRE gets a bit of a bad rap nowadays, mostly due to the famous Voltaire quote, the Holy Roman Empire was in no way holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. And to be fair, at Voltaire's time this was certainly true, and it was debatably true for all of the HRE's history. However, the first emperor of the HRE, the great Charlemagne, was crowned as emperor of all Romans. This was mostly an act of securing prestige and legitimacy for the Pope and Charlemagne as the new rulers of Western Europe and Catholicism as the dominant and legitimate form of Christianity. Personally, I would argue this is really the weakest claim to the successor of Rome. Firstly, there already was an emperor of the Romans, or, well, I really mean empress. Her name was Irene, and she was the regent for her son, Constantine VI. This was even part of the reason the Pope crowned Charlemagne. The West was simply unwilling to accept Irene. In truth though, even by the fall of the Byzantine Empire in 1453, the HRE was not Roman. It was a Germanic Empire through and through, and that's something we'll talk about more later in this iceberg. The line of secession then follows the Byzantine Empire. As I already stated, the Byzantines fell in 1453. So then who succeeded them as inheritors of Rome's legacy? Well, it was the Ottoman Turks. Mehmed II, or Mehmed the Conqueror, claimed the title of Roman Emperor on the basis that he had conquered Constantinople the seat of the Byzantine Empire, which had been the United Roman Empire. And frankly, this makes a lot of sense when you think about it. By 1453, it had been over a millennia since Rome was the capital of the Roman Empire. Constantinople had become the capital of the Roman Empire, and Mehmed had just conquered it. In fact, Mehmed was extremely interested in actually capturing the rest of what had been the Roman Empire. He even mounted an invasion of Italy, capturing the town of Otranto. If Mehmed hadn't died, there's a decent chance that Christendom would have had to unite in another crusade to push the Ottomans out of Italy. Mehmed's successors would never quite have the same drive as him. Instead, they wanted to conquer Vienna, the capital of the Archduchy of Austria and seat of the von Habsburgs, the emperor of the HRE. The thinking being that if they vanished the other claimants to the title, then the title was theirs and theirs alone. Which, to be fair, does kind of make sense. The Ottomans were extremely serious about their claim, and it became a defining title for the sultans. It was only as the Ottomans began to shift their focus more towards Arabia and the title of caliph that the claim began to take a back seat in terms of importance. There is one more claimant we should look at, the Russian Empire. This claim centers around the idea of Russia being the inheritors of the Orthodox religion. When Byzantium fell, the Tsardom of Muscovy, which would later become Russia, was the most powerful remaining Orthodox state in the world. Because of this, an idea began to develop that painted its capital, Moscow, as a sort of third Rome. 
The idea was that Moscow would be the place where the Roman Empire would be reborn from the ashes. To further this claim, Ivan III of Russia married Sophia Paleologos, the niece of Constantine XI, who was the last Byzantine emperor. Through this marriage, Ivan claimed that he inherited the title upon Constantine's death. However, it should really be noted that Roman traditions, even as far back as a united Roman Empire, never recognized any sort of automatic inheritance. In fact, 90% of the time, the conflicts of the empire were over who would inherit, and it was kind of a tradition to argue about it for a while. All in all, the claim here is mostly centered around Russia being the inheritors of the Orthodox religion, and by extension, the Byzantine Empire. So those are the main cases. Personally, I really think that when Constantinople fell, so did the Roman Empire. The inheritance of Rome is not about the title of Emperor of the Romans. Instead, it's about what we find in our culture. The use of Latin, architectural designs, the Western system of law, and all of the other many influences in our modern world are the inheritance of the empire. That being said, all hail Mehmed the Conqueror, Kaiser Irum, the Sultan of two lands and the Khan of two seas, conqueror of Constantinople and the true heir of Rome. I don't think I need to tell you who I think has the best claim. One day, I will get way deeper into this history, as it's actually pretty interesting. But until then, This does flow pretty well into our next question. Who would be the Roman Emperor today? Well, if we follow the path of succession in the Ottoman Empire, then we come to this guy, Harun Osman Osmanoglu, and I apologize if that is incorrectly pronounced, the current head of the House of Osman, and the man who would be Caliph. But amidst the fall of the Byzantines, one man managed to escape from the downfall, a man named Andreas Paleologos. He was the son of Thomas Paleologos, the famous Duke of Morea, who was the brother of Constantine XII, the last Byzantine emperor. Andreas claimed the imperial title following the downfall of his house in 1483. It should be noted here that his father never claimed the title, and just as with Ivan in Russia, his claim is dubious at best. Andreas, though, fell into poverty following the downfall of his family, and desperate for money, sold his titles to Charles VIII, King of France. There was one small condition, however. Charles must, after his conquest of the Ottomans, return the Duchy of Moria to Andreas, the same duchy title his father had held. Charles died before he could act on his new title, and Andreas reclaimed his imperial titles once again. Andreas would go on to die in poverty in Rome in 1502. His will left his titles to Ferdinand II of Aragon and Isabella I of Castile. The two would never act on them, but if we assume Andreas actually legitimately claimed the title, then it passed to them. The realms of the two monarchs would be united upon their death, and the Kingdom of Spain would be formed. If we follow the line of secession, then we come to this man, Felipe VI, the current King of Spain. Although, to be fair, the Kingdom of Spain has changed hands many times, so it's tough to say who would actually have the best claim. If you decide to follow the line of the HRE, then you come to this man, Karl von Habsburg. His ancestor, Francis II, was the last Holy Roman Emperor, before Napoleon ruined all that. So if the title of Holy Roman Emperor was to somehow re-emerge, then it would be Karl who would be the main claimant. In the end, it doesn't really matter. But if I had to throw my hat in the ring, I would lean towards Harun Osman as the main successor to the title of Roman Emperor. Frankly, conquest triumphs most things when it comes to Rome, and titles aren't really any different. In the end, of course, it doesn't matter, as Rome being re-established is about as likely as me becoming King of England, so it's really a moot point. Livia, born Livia Drusilla, was the wife of the Roman Emperor Augustus, and is painted as the source of damn near everything bad that ever happened to Augustus, his family, or his empire. Well, that might be going a bit too far, but historians of the time, such as Tacitus and Suetonius, loved to paint Livy as the scheming mastermind behind Augustus, who among other things, was responsible for the deaths of Augustus' nephew Marcellus, and even the deaths of Agrippa Postumus, the adopted son of Augustus. This was all done so that Tiberius would gain the throne. Tiberius was apparently easily influenced by Livia, and she did all this as a way to gain influence, blah, 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 blah. Livia was certainly influential. I mean, she was the wife of the emperor after all. Augustus even called her his chief confidant, and the two apparently discussed the situation of the empire and what to do pretty often. But I seriously doubt she was this evil woman who was only out for power, as she is painted as in many of the histories of the period. I mean, seriously, basically anyone in the extended Julio-Claudian dynasty dies, and somehow Livia had a hand in it. One day, I will make a video examining this history more in depth, but until that day, all I have to say is that Livia was probably mostly innocent. 
Sulla was one of the most important Romans in history, and he's someone who gets overshadowed by men like Caesar, who was just about three decades younger than Sulla himself. Sulla got his start in basically the same way every important Roman did, through his military experience. He fought in Africa, Germania, Anatolia, and even in Italy itself. He would go on to serve as consul in 88 BCE. It was during this time that he would march on Rome in protest of laws made by his enemy Gaius Marius. I can't get too deep into it, as frankly this video would be hours long if I did, but it eventually spiraled into what was Rome's first large-scale civil war, a war Sulla would win. Assuming the mantle of dictator, Sulla proceeded to enact swift and vicious revenge, along with fixing what he saw as flaws in the Republic. He likely ordered the death of over 9,000 people, and even ordered Caesar to be put to death, but Caesar was able to escape with the help of his relatives. Sulla would go on to basically completely rewrite the Roman code of law and conduct in his own image. He would expand the Senate, create a new jury to hold senators to the letter of the law, take away much of the power of the plebeian tribunes, along with many other changes. However, sadly for him, much of his changes would be overturned by two of his lieutenants and successors, the famous Pompey and Crassus. Sulla's legacy is one of ruthlessness and bloodshed, and frankly it can even be argued that it was Sulla who laid the groundwork for the Republic to fall. Constantine the Great was the first Roman Emperor to convert to Christianity, and his rule represented the beginning of the shift of Rome from a polytheistic state to a Christian monotheistic state. We aren't quite sure when Constantine was born, but we know it was after 280 AD in Naxos, modern-day niche in Serbia. He was the son of a very successful military officer, Glavius Valerius Constantius. His father would eventually be raised to the rank of Caesar, or junior emperor, of the Western Roman Empire. Constantine was left in the east and raised in the court of Diocletian, the senior emperor of the east. He was something of a hostage, as none of the emperors, junior or senior, quite trusted the others. This didn't stop Constantine from firstly attaining the highest levels of education available, and secondly enrolling in the Roman army. He fought across the eastern half of the empire, and was seemingly fairly good at war, being promoted to tribune during his service. In 305, both Diocletian and Maximian, the emperor of the west, would step down. Galerius would succeed Diocletian, while Constantius, Constantine's father, would succeed Maximian. It was believed by many at the time that Constantine and Maxentius, Maximian's son, would both be chosen to be junior emperors. Instead, both were skipped over and replaced by Flavius Valerius Severus in the west and Galerius Valerius Maximinus in the east. Constantine was now in more danger than ever, and both his father and himself knew it. Luckily for Constantine, his father still held quite a bit of power. Constantius requested his son join him on his campaigns in Britain. In some stories, Galerius simply agreed with no strings attached. In others, it was only after Galerius got massively drunk that he gave permission. It's frankly hard to say what the truth is, but in any case, Constantine joined his father in Britain. It was during this campaign that Constantius fell ill and eventually died. Before his death, he proclaimed his full support for raising Constantine to the rank of Augustus, senior emperor. The troops loyal to Constantius quickly pledged their loyalty to Constantine, and the armies and provinces of Gaul and Britain followed shortly after. Hispania notably rejected this appointment. Constantine then sent notice of his father's death along with the notice of his ascension to Galerius in the east. Galerius was infuriated, and at first seemed to be leaning towards declaring war on Constantine, but he was talked down, and the two developed a sort of compromise. Constantine would be granted the rank of Caesar, while Flavius Valerius Severus would become Augustus. Constantine, probably knowing he could not win a civil war, accepted, and Galerius personally sent him the traditional purple robes of the emperor. Constantine was granted the provinces of Gaul, Britain, and Hispania. Kind of funny when you consider they were about to rebel against him just a little bit ago, but whatever. During this period, he fought back the Picts in Britain and the Franks in Gaul. There is a great story there whereby the two kings of the Franks, Aseric and Mariogias, were captured and fed to beasts inside of Trier's amphitheater, but that's a story for another time. Trier seemed to be Constantine's favorite city, and a great expansion of the city took place under his reign. This was also the time where we see his image as a Christian sympathizer began to develop. He outlawed persecutions of Christians within his realm, and ordered most of the property and other goods seized from them in centuries past returned. Back in Rome, trouble was brewing. Maxentius, the son of Maximian, who had been skipped over, had been plotting. 
He took the appointment of Constantine as Caesar as a grave insult, and it seemed to accelerate his plans. He rebelled, claiming the title of emperor. Galerius told Flavius Valerius Severus to deal with the rebellion. Sadly for Severus though, the troops used by him were the same troops that Maximian had been in charge of, and they almost instantly defected to Maxentius' side. Severus was imprisoned, and Maximian, who was in retirement at this point in the Italian countryside, journeyed to Trier to speak to Constantine. Maximian offered Constantine the hand of his daughter in marriage, along with the promise of being raised to the rank of Augustus in exchange for his support of Maxentius' rebellion. Constantine accepted, but instead of charging in headfirst into the conflict, he remained in Gaul and then Britain along with the vast majority of his troops. In the meantime, Maximian apparently had a falling out with his son, and after failing to usurp the title of emperor, returned to Constantine. A council then occurred in 308, where Galerius, Diocletian, and Maximian basically argued over who should be Augustus and who should be Caesars. They decided that Valerius Licinius Licinius would become Augustus of the West, with Constantine serving as his Caesar. This basically did nothing, as Constantine refused to accept the demotion, Maxentius was still mad and had an army now, and Maximian was now mad because he had apparently been in the running to be Augustus once again in the west. Yeah, the situation was a bit complicated. In 310, Maximian led his own rebellion against Constantine. Sadly for him though, the army he had mostly remained loyal to Constantine, and he was forced to flee. Eventually, Constantine caught up to him. He pardoned the man, but apparently strongly encouraged him to, well, I can't actually say this word on YouTube, but let's just say Maximian ended up dead. Maxentius used this opportunity to paint himself as a devoted son looking to avenge his father, and gained quite a bit of public sympathy. In the meantime, over in the east, Emperor Galerius died in 311, and this was when the whole system basically fell apart. Maxentius seized Anatolia and began to fortify his position against Constantine. Sadly for Maxentius though, his popularity was beginning to wane, and rebellions and riots began to pop up all over the place, including in Roman Carthage. It was at this time that Constantine crossed the Alps, and began his war against Maxentius. I won't get too deep into this, as this episode is already long enough, but Constantine managed to win despite being numerically outnumbered. After this, Constantine slowly asserted himself as the most powerful man in the empire. He was able to push for the Edict of Milan to be issued in 313, which ended Christian persecution in the entire empire. After a series of wars and political intrigue, Constantine became the sole emperor in 326, and he was now the undisputed ruler of Rome. It was around this time that Constantine began his plans to build a new capital in the east, Constantinople. The rest of his reign was mostly focused on the frankly more boring aspects of empire, monetary reforms, and so on. Constantine would die in 337. It's said he was baptized just before he died, but some sources dispute this. Constantine would be succeeded by his three sons, Constantine II, Constantius II, and Constance. Not very creative in the whole naming convention. He likely intended for something similar to the old system of the Tetrarchy to make a return, something that didn't quite happen, but that's a story for another time. Constantine was the first emperor to embrace, or at least tolerate, Christianity and it was his reign that started the empire on the path towards full conversion to the new religion. His legacy would live on for millennia afterwards, not only for his stance towards Christianity, but also in his new city, Constantinople. The Senate and the Empire refers to the power dynamic between the Senate and the Empire during Rome's later years. The Senate was in a bit of an odd place when Augustus came into his power as emperor. It was an arguably democratic body within what was essentially a totalitarian dictatorship where power was concentrated in the hands of one man, the emperor. Because of this, the senate was in a sort of limbo state. It was too ingrained into Roman society to simply get rid of, but it also simply didn't hold any sort of real power. Instead, it became essentially a rubber stamp for the emperors. If the senate tried to stop or go against the emperor, they would either be ignored or simply dissolved with new senators replacing them. And yet, many emperors, especially the earlier ones, still went out of their way to ensure their influence over the body was at least somewhat hidden. So why was that? Well, I think it has to do a lot with Rome's extreme aversion to anything even approaching a king. The Roman people would be upset if an individual was seen as obviously controlling a body such as the Senate. That was what those old kings did, and they were bad after all. So the emperor had to walk a bit of a tightrope. 
They couldn't and wouldn't allow the Senate to have any actual power over themselves or the state, but they had to be discreet enough in their challenges to the Senate to ensure that it looked like they were working with the body to govern the empire. Because of this, the Senate remained the entity that elected emperors. It was even the Senate that technically gave the emperor his imperium. It was really only in the late imperial period, post about 180 AD, that the Senate really began to be obviously relegated, and by 300 AD, it was made clear that the emperor answered to no one, not even the Senate. But for the early Roman emperors, it was a tight line they walked, and if one of them had been just a little more open in their, now blindingly obvious, power plays over the Senate, it may very well have spelled doom for the Roman Empire, and we may have seen a resurgence of the Republic. And this is where we will pause our examination for today. We are now getting into some things that I don't think a lot of people think about all that often in their study of Roman history. Hopefully this has inspired you to do your own investigations into these figures and their history. Join me next time as we continue to dig even deeper. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. This is something a little different, but I hope you still enjoy it. Definitely let me know if any of these topics in particular has struck your fancy, and I may add it to the list to cover more in depth in the future. I apologize that this video is again only one tier, but these are the densest tiers and I felt they deserved their own episodes. If you have any comments or questions on the video or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.